Um, so today, in our second video, uh, I would like to say a few words about Buddhism. And uh, just a word about the structure. Um, in the, uh, at the course website, uh, you will see that uh, it may be divided up into a number of uh, main topics, such as a brief introduction to the religious tradition, its core teachings, its contributions to spiritual understanding, and its contributions to virtuous living. So much of what, everything that I say today can be fitted under one of those four headings, and I'll try to hit each of the four as I go along. But uh, also to make this of more dynamic, I probably will just start by telling you a few stories about Buddhism. Um, well, first of all, how to compress into the nine minutes that I have something of, the, of lasting significance and about Buddhism. It's a vast and ancient religious tradition, 2,600 years old, and few spiritual figures today are more beloved than Buddha. Globally, universally, the image of this, uh, of this great meditator, this saintly human being uh, who abandoned his, uh, his wealthy and pampered and upbringing as a prince, who abandons that because of a growing dissatisfaction with the difficulties of life, who abandons that and all of the privileges that, that, that go along with that to take up the most extreme form of, of uh, living in, in, in the forest, uh, looking for the truth, if you will, going off to the woods uh, way more intensely than a Thoreau in the, in the American literary scene could ever even imagine. Uh, six years of, uh, of intense ascetical practices, of fasting, of meditating, of going of, with, with very little clothing through all kinds of weather, um, uh, meditating in places with uh, lots of uh, animals that uh, may have posed a threat, um, and fasting at one point, according to the stories that the Buddha himself told, where he basically, there was nothing left to him except a little bit of skin and bones. Who was this figure? Who was this person that has fascinated for so long? Now, in the academic world, um, there, is, uh, all, there are always new um, theories developing about each of these religious traditions. We can't really get into any of those details now, but let it just be said that this image of the Buddha, uh, this image of this beloved figure, lately has been subjected to academic criticism. Uh, those who say that our conception of Buddhism today that we have in the so-called West is actually itself a product of 19th century um, intellectual and spiritual activity, activities of Westerners. I'd like for all that to be acknowledged, and still I'd like to return to this beloved figure, to the Buddha sitting under the, the tree of enlightenment. Um, so for many of us, when we think of Buddhism, we think of, we think of the Buddha, and we think of someone meditating, perhaps under a tree, the tree in northern India, in Bodh Gaya, where he attained uh, awakening. Um, if, you were, if I were to probe a little bit more and ask newcomers to the topic of Buddhism, what else they know, they might say, oh, isn't that the religion about suffering? And of course, there are a few words more associated with Buddhism than the word suffering. I would say that the, the most important word associated with Buddhism is implicit in the Buddha's name, his title. It wasn't his birth name. His birth name was Siddhartha. It's, it's, it's in the title that he has, that he bears, Buddha, which means awakened. The one who woke up, the one who awakened. Awakened? Awakened to what? Yes, and that, of course, is the great secret and appeal of Buddhism. To what did the Buddha awaken? In a few minutes, I'll try to say a few more words about that. But let's come back for a moment to this most usually uh, evoked image of Buddhism as the religion of suffering. Well, the word suffering is a translation, one of a number of translations, of a, of a Sanskrit word, dukkha. And the Pali word, which is how Buddhism is often also expressed in its scriptures, uh, is, is very close, very close. Dukkha. Dukkha can be translated as suffering. And uh, it seems to persist as the most usual translation. Academics, scholars of the tradition, have suggested alternatives such as unsatisfactoriness. So that 
the first of the Buddha's great teachings would run something like this. On one view, life is suffering, which, of course, doesn't strike most people up front as something that, that's very appealing. They say, well, my life has moments of suffering, but I try to minimize them as much as possible. So unsatisfactoriness is often proposed as a better translation. Life, and let's modify that a bit, life in itself as it exists isn't, isn't it an outright form of suffering, but life has its unsat dissatisfactions. It seems that no matter how high the accomplishment, it's not long before it starts to be muddied and sullied by something else. One wins a great award, and almost immediately the criticism starts. And the criticism can be so overwhelming that it can make one wish that the award had not been won. That's what we're talking about. And we're all familiar with these dissatisfactions in life. And if we were to multiply them in, in such a way as must have occurred in the life of Siddhartha when he was in his late 20s, we can see that often there's an impulse to want to go off to the woods and meditate. Whereas in the case of young Siddhartha, or Siddhartha, he actually did that, and he discovered a way to awakening. Um, so, uh, again, in a moment or two, I'll say more about uh, what, this, what this awakening is. Um, so... Uh, to go back to this word dukkha, um, I like to try to convey its meaning by looking at what the word, one of the meanings of the original uh, Sanskrit and Pali word. So du or dus uh, means, can mean, uh, you know, bad or, 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 or unpleasant or uh, it can mean, um, it can mean something that's poorly adapted to its environment. And ka, one meaning of the word ka is a wheel. So dukkha would be a kind of misfitting wheel on a chariot. Let's say that your axle, let's say that the wheel is bent. The hub is a little bit uh, kind of t uh, twisted so that you have an uneven ride going down the, down the roadway. That's dukkha. And the opposite of dukkha is sukha. Ka, wheel, su means pleasant or well or good. So if dus means bad and su means good, then a dukkha is a kind of wobbly ride in your chariot or your car. That's unpleasant. That would be dissatisfying. Sukha, however, means a smooth ride, happiness. So if we, my preferred translation for dukkha is unhappiness. And my preferred translation, and it's a standard translation, of sukha, one of its many meanings, is happiness. And so, in a way, Buddhism is a religion about happiness. This is a fact that's often obscured. Often Buddhism, especially convert Buddhism in, in the global world, is often focused upon meditation, whereas in the Buddhist world itself, traditional Buddhist world, people, only monastics meditated, not even all of them meditated. Meditation is central to Buddhism, but it's a full-spectrum religion that offered many other ways for people to experience this happiness that the Buddha was ultimately concerned with discovering. He awakened to happiness. Of course, what's happiness? I'll have more to say about that in another video, no doubt. But happiness, uh, or sukha, is a life in which the fundamental sense of a misfit of misalignment, dukkha, has somehow or other been obliterated, been removed. And that's what uh, the Buddha awakened to. Now, um, so it can be difficult to try to say what exactly the awakening or the enlightenment of the Buddha was about, but what we can say is that it is a state of consciousness in which the awareness of fundamental dissatisfaction has evaporated. Um, there is a, uh, I, I, I would quote to you, or at least do it in paraphrase, a, an, a woman, a nun, uh, who early on attained awakening, attained enlightenment, and she uh, was filled with ecstasy. She looked around herself, Sumangala's mother is her name, and she just exclaimed how ecstatic it was to be free of the, of the dissatisfactions of dukkha. So happiness, then, is what we awaken to. Um, and this happiness is a freedom from what in Buddhism is called uh, the three marks, 
And the three marks fundamentally come down to freedom from the idea that I am an individual self who is subject to birth, old age, disease, and death. This is where our sense of disease arises. And awakening is to awaken from that into the happiness of realizing that there is no death and that we are not finite individual selves, but that somehow we are all part of this massive consciousness that uh, binds us all together, that interrelates everything.